All right, geographers, I'm coming to you again from Studio 1A of my COVID bunker, this time to talk about maps. And this is, uh, yeah, it's not going to be the usual map stuff that I talk about in my other classes. We're going to get into what maps are. We're going to talk about how to read a map, um, but it's going to be different from say, you know, figuring out how to get from point A to point B. We're not going to do this army guy stuff uh, that we see here depicted in this picture. We're going to be thinking critically about maps. How can we read these uh, as good cultural geographers or human geographers, right? So that's what I'm going to be getting into today. So the key thing here, why I take the time to talk about this stuff. It's not like you hear these things with, from, you know, geography posters have these all the time. Uh, things about, you know, so few Americans can find such and such on a map or whatever. And it's true. We are pretty terrible when it comes to where stuff is, being able to locate that on a, a map. But that, to me, is not as important as being able to uh, be able to look at a map and carefully read it in the sense of, you know, question. What is it showing? What is it telling me? What are the strengths of this map? What are the flaws? How am I getting this information? Who produced this information? That kind of stuff. So that's what we're getting into. We're getting into the social side of maps and mapping. And really the, the key thing here is to remember that people make these things, right? Maps should be questioned. And, you know, in addition to that, not just maps, but mapping technology uh, as well, like our phones, right? Google Maps and Apple Maps and these other things we have on our phones, these location-based services, we should be questioning that stuff with the full, you know, knowledge that people created these, people populate these things with data, and people ultimately use them. We've got to critically read this stuff. Here's a good example of critically reading uh, stuff. This was after the 2016 election. And we'll, we'll be looking at a lot of election maps because they're useful to look at here. But uh, this one was great. Uh, sent up by uh, Breitbart showing what a landslide victory uh, it was for Donald Trump. No, this I mean, if you really just take two seconds to look at this map, you can see that somebody would like, uh, Microsoft Paint or whatever kind of just took a red uh, map of the United States and then scribbled in some blue on the coast. I mean, if you really look at it, you see this doesn't follow counties or any actual boundaries. This is complete garbage right here, right? It's just flawed. It's lying. Um, and so that, I mean, that's one thing to look at right there. There's a lot of just flat out garbage out there. But there's also a lot of stuff that can fit into the category of propaganda or can just be poorly designed. Maybe things that were, you know, produced by a graphic designer, somebody who's not even trained in cartography, makes a map for some news story or whatever, simply something to go on to Twitter or Facebook or, or whatever you're looking at. You know, we need to be able to question this stuff. So that's this is some of the stuff we'll be getting into. Another great thing with this is we might not even think about looking at maps specifically, but we, you know, we use our phones or the computer in the car or whatever for the GPS navigation capabilities, right? I'm here. I need to go there. What do I do, car? Or what do I do, phone? Tell me how to get there. And there are great stories. You can find these. I'm always looking for these things, but there are great stories of how just GPS goes wrong. And it's really, it's based on the fact that it's not the GPS necessarily. It's the fact that the databases, the underlying data that are feeding this whole navigation process, these things are screwed up, right? I do like this one simply because the sign is so permanent, right? It's like they can't get it fixed uh, at that main database. They can't actually fix the data so they just put the sign up here to kind of help people figure out where it is they need to go, all right? Because there's some error 
constantly taking people to this location that is not Mount Rushmore. Um, so some of this is simply, it's the database. We have other stories uh, where it's, you know, maybe it's the database, maybe it's simply the person turned a little too quickly or whatever, but I love stuff like this. And I mean, I get it. I've done stuff almost like this, where, you know, the GPS says, turn left, and you turn left and you realize, oh, this, this can't be it because I can't successfully drive this way or whatever, right? Um, but what I love about this woman uh, is that she didn't quit. She really committed to the uh, the turn, right? I mean, look how far into the water that car is. I think most of us, hopefully, uh, would start to make that turn or drive into this area. And then as soon as we saw the, you know, the ocean uh, right there, we would apply the brakes and, and question, right? But, you know, it doesn't always work uh, that way. This is another great one. Uh, I honestly, I can see doing this as a teenager uh, myself, um, but a guy was told by his his phone, um, by the GPS to drive into this location. It wound up being the secure uh, NSA property, right? But what's great is that like not only did it tell him to do this, um, but you can see in that third paragraph, police at the National Security Agency ordered the driver to turn around after he went through a checkpoint unauthorized. unauthorized. The teen panicked and took off. I mean, that's fantastic right there, where you not only do you make this uh, horrible choice of uh, trusting the phone and going into this area and you make the wrong term, but you also try to evade NSA agents and they start shooting at you, right? Again, all the more reason to critically question what's going on. This is my all-time favorite, though, and, and if you've had other classes with me, you've heard that I talk about this lady all the time, the, the Belgian lady who's phenomenal, and the idea is she was in Belgium, uh, had to drive a short distance. You can see here it's 38 miles. I've seen different numbers here across the web, um, but she's only driving about 38 miles out of her way. She winds up in Croatia, uh, and you know, as I said, you know, we Americans, we have no idea where stuff is. So me saying she starts in Belgium, winds up in Croatia, you might go like, I don't know, is that bad? Um, it's a good 900 miles out of the way. It's the equivalent, uh, you know, for my Antelope Valley listeners here, if I say, hey, I got to drive to Rosamond uh, and I wind up in Canada, right? I mean, that's a huge, huge difference there. But even, you know, if we were to do that, to make it to Canada, our one excuse would be, well, at least we never actually left our country, right? But this Belgian lady, she went through multiple international crossings. Um, she, you know, had to fill up multiple times her, her gas tank and all that. I mean, she just kept going. And the only reason that we ever found her uh, was because her son reported her missing. And what's really great is that she gave an interview to the press, um, which is phenomenal. Like I would never ever talk to the press if something like this happened. Right. Um, but, but yet she did. So we know about it. Bless her heart. Uh, and she simply said, Hey, I was having a great time driving. I mean, you know, listening to the music or whatever. It was just, you know, a pleasant experience. Wasn't thinking that much about it. Just kept going and, and, you know, trusted the GPS. Now, clearly, this is extreme, um, you know, and, and maybe there's some kind of age-induced, um, you know, degenerative disease or something like that that caused her not to question um, the, uh, you know, what the GPS is, is saying, not question the multiple border crossings and things like that. I don't know if she's still driving. Maybe it's best if she isn't. Um, but still, I think this is fascinating because it's extreme, but you can kind of see how it could happen, right? It, it's, we trust this stuff so much. We don't question it at all. Our phone tells us something, we go with it. The internet, we do some Google search or whatever. It tells us something, we go with it. Um, you know, that's, that's something we need to stop. We need to pause. So every answer you get, you need to say like, Is this, does this make sense? Right? I tell my students, uh, ask yourself, am I driving to Croatia? I think that's a good way to think about this. Am I making a horrible mistake right here? 
simply because, you know, I keyed in the wrong thing. I switched two numbers. I did, you know, something along those lines, right? Maps are a great example of this, of where we need to pause, question what we've done, uh, and, and think about it. You know, what's what's going on here? What are we what are we trying to do? What is the map telling us or what is the GPS telling us or whatever uh, it might be? Always question this stuff. Ask yourself, am I going to Croatia? And hopefully by the end of this stuff, you'll have the tools to not go to Croatia. Now, this is another um, it's an example of somebody getting lost, but it's also kind of saying like, you know, don't count on technology to keep us from getting lost, right? It was the idea that this stuff, like, would be impossible to get lost from here on out. We always will have these issues because nothing will be perfect. And that's perfectly fine. We just, again, it's this idea of not giving over all control, all decision-making to technology of some kind. All right, so there's... There's a little pep talk to start this off with, uh, but let's get into maps uh, and mapping and the, the art of mapping. Uh, and maps have been around forever. Uh, as long as, you know, there have been humans, there have most likely been maps of some kind because we are just inherently spatial beings. I've, I've talked about this, I'm sure, with you guys uh, already. In fact, let's, let's do this pop quiz. Uh, how old uh, are, are human beings? When did we show up? I'm waiting. Your hand in the back? Uh-huh. Right. Perfect. Yeah, over 200,000 years old, right? So we're, we're babies uh, in the grand scheme of the planet, which is 4.6 billion years old. But as soon as humans show up, we start cruising around, right? And we start, where do we start? Where does the first human show up? That's right, East Africa. Uh, but not every human is from East Africa today, right? So we cruise all over the world. And part of this, um, you know, we're able to do it just, just because we are spatial actors. We can move. We can start walking. We can, you know, make relatively rational decisions with very little information uh, around us. So we can go from point A to point B. But humans would have quickly, um, you know, started mapping stuff out, started to record stuff. Um, from, you know, the European context and, and the Levant and, and these areas where we, we tend to start with, uh, um, you know, world history and stuff like this. Uh, I've got an example of on the left, um, uh, European map of the world. Uh, on the right is a Babylonian map, I believe it's of the world as well. Um, not really sure. I just love that both of them are round, right? You can see similarities in there. Um, yeah, and that makes sense. You know, we kind of operate within these 360 degrees. We can, you know, go in any direction from zero to 360 degrees. It kind of makes sense to conceive of the world as it, at the very least a flat circle. All right, and so you can see with this map of uh, uh, the, the medieval map, um, all we have are Asia, Europe, and Africa. There's no Antarctica, no, you know, Australia, North America, South America, any of this stuff, because we're, we're dealing with the Middle Ages, right? And it's called a TO map. What's kind of cool, just kind of dirty trivia here, uh, is Asia. It's always at the top, and this is, it's, you know, Asia known as the Orient. We talk about orienting a map, and we typically have north at the top, and blah, 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 blah. All that's connected here. It goes back to this tradition. So going back centuries, right? It's the idea of orienting a map, actually orient it with the directions, all right? So these are some relatively simple, um, you could argue primitive maps, and they're not quite useful, like this medieval one especially, you know, good luck using that to help you go from Europe to Asia, right? Not, it's not the most useful map, but it was a way to conceive of the world. But honestly, um, you know, folks, Europeans specifically, had been mapping the world in a much more complex way for centuries, you know, prior to like that 
medieval one, but after the Babylonian one. Uh, this is Ptolemy's map of the world, and it's a reproduction. Uh, I don't believe we have any any actual original maps that Ptolemy made uh, that still exist today. Uh, and in fact, what happened, so he was a Greek, so we're going back about 2,000 years, when he maps out the known world as, as much as the Greeks knew of the world. Um, the Greek Empire falls, Romans fall. It's actually the uh, uh, Islamic Caliphate in the Middle East that preserves a lot of this stuff while the Europeans are making all of their very simple TO maps and, and all of that. Uh, and then this was a later, this is a reproduction from the Renaissance. So it was during the Renaissance, a lot of knowledge came from the Muslim world into Europe, and, and that's how we have a lot of this stuff today. Now we're able to look and see what the Greeks did. And you can see this is way more complex than, say, this stuff right here. Uh, and you also see one key thing that we're looking at is the grid in place. So those grid lines, that's latitude and longitude. Ptolemy was the guy who came up with this stuff. Uh, and so he ordered the world with this grid so we could find an exact location. If you knew your your latitude value and your longitude value, where these two lines intersected in the grid, that would be your location, right? Where you are, where you want to go, or whatever. So he comes up with that. Uh, also, north is at the top, um, which is kind of maybe hard to see. You can see for perspective, um, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, right here. This would be the Horn of Africa. There's Italy, the boot right there, right? So you're getting a sense of where we're looking. Uh, so north is at the top simply because Ptolemy liked the way that looked. There's no great scientific reason for this. It just, that's where it is. It's north goes on the top because Ptolemy said so, and we've kept that to this day. Uh, and it actually turns out there's a lot of stuff we do today that's just because of, that's because of the, how the Greeks did it, right? That's the only real reason. Uh, it's tradition, but it's not necessarily the best way or the only way or whatever. So again, a, you know, a way to see, yeah, we should question what we're seeing on the map, right? Where, you know, north is placed, how, how it is oriented and all that. That's a legitimate question we can be asking. Another great thing about Ptolemy, he's held up as this great geographer, and he, you know, he's clearly a, a smart guy, but apparently he hated white space on a map, um, which I get. Having made my own maps, it's a thing where, yeah, it can kind of look, I don't know, empty and kind of lame when you have it. Um, where some of us might, you know, work to reframe the map or add some more, you know, data or something like that. Uh, Ptolemy just made stuff up. He just decided, you know what, I don't like this big empty space, and it's empty because we've, you know don't have any expeditions that have gone in there. We don't have any information about what's on this continent or whatever. Well, I just make it up. I mean, just, you know, pretend that there's something there. And that's something to really also, again, question. Um, you know, it's, it's stuff like Legends of Atlantis and stuff like that. And people talk about old maps and the, you know, the secrets they reveal and all that. A lot of it's probably bullshit. Um, a lot of it is probably a way to not have white space to uh, um, look smarter, um, to, you know, have it uh, uh, sell if you're actually selling copies of these things, which I don't know if Ptolemy is actually doing that stuff, but like in the European tradition, uh, maps were products to be sold, and we'll see examples of that stuff in a bit. Um, but yeah, it's the kind of thing, a lot of this was complete garbage, but it's held up as, as you know, scientific truth and, and these important origins of science and that kind of stuff. Just keep this in mind, right? That it started out with making stuff up uh, and doing stuff just because this one guy liked the way it looked. But there you go. This is really what, what's seen as kind of the birth of, of modern cartography or what we think of as like real map making, right? And it's not just the, the Greeks or even the Europeans in general. Here's a, a map from China. Uh, and so you can see, this is about a thousand years old. Um, 
what's cool about this, I think, is that we see the grid as well. Right? Um, you know, almost seems to be a universal way of figuring out how to divide up very big expanses of land. Uh, so that's just kind of cool right there. Um, but, it, you know, we move forward into the Renaissance and the age of exploration and, you know, colonialism and all of that. Mapping big areas becomes very important because different European, um, you know, empires are trying to grow. They're trying to send more ships out into the world. And, uh, you know, you need maps to know where you can go or can't go or haven't gone yet and should go explore or whatever. Um, so maps are being produced. And if you look at this one, you can probably kind of make it out. I mean, you can see down here in the bottom, you know, America, there's the clue. So we've got North America here, South America right there, Antarctica, massive uh, down here. I'm guessing this is Australia uh, in this area. <clears throat> so with this particular map, yeah, the boundaries aren't that great. Um, but you can also see, again, it's that issue with white space. Like Canada, I, I am assuming this is Canada uh, up here. Nobody knows what is up here, or at least this particular map maker didn't know this. Of course, you know, the Inuit Eskimo, whoever indigenous folks were in this particular region knew. Um, but of this map maker of the, the Europeans, this was unknown. So what do you do? You put a paragraph in there, right? You write some, some text in there to make it look like there's a lot of stuff going on. But you can tell a lot of these early maps, you, you know they're bad. You know they don't have a lot of good, useful information when the borders are gorgeous, right? Look at the, the detail, the line work and all that. A lot of these things, they you know produce the map as best they could. And then they'd spend most of the time on the, the really pretty outside stuff. So it still was attractive. And it was like a way to trick people into thinking like, oh, okay, well, this is good stuff. I'm willing to spend money to purchase this map, right? Or employ this cartographer to make another one or whatever it might be, All right? These borders are always key uh, in here. You see little like comic books and stuff going on, um, you know, for maps of the continent of Africa. Yeah, the borders were quite complex because no Europeans could actually survive and make it into the interior of Africa for many years because of, you know, disease or animal attacks or whatever it might be. Uh, so a lot of these maps just have, you know, elaborate little depictions on the side, but the maps themselves are crap. Now, eventually, techniques get better. Exploration is, you know, continuing to happen. More information is, is being you know, found out and, and discovered and, and shared about the world. And so the maps get better, right? We can see maps at a certain point. The, the shapes make more sense. They might not be perfect um, or, or, you know, as good as some of the, the cartography we have today, but it looks pretty good, right? The grid is is maintained throughout a lot of this. It's just been kept as this, this proper way to you know, figure out location and help with navigation uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and so we get to a point where maps are pretty good. Okay, now when I say maps too, we tend to think of these things as being, you know, paper maps. Like we see here in the, you know, in a textbook or hanging in a classroom or, or whatever. Um, you know, and, and we might not question about what's going on with a lot of this stuff. But honestly... Um, the maps we have today, there's been a lot of work that's gone in to this stuff. Um, you know, just making this really scientific, making sure that we are having high quality maps. Okay, in this, and again, we'll get into more digital stuff here uh, in a bit. Um, but for now, I'm getting, you know, we're we're talking about stuff now in the 20th century. Uh, so we're dealing with, you know, paper stuff pre digital mapping. But a lot of this stuff um, that we take for granted today is based on this guy, Arthur Robinson, who was an incredibly important cartographer. And he still does elements of cartography, still used today, it's what I used, um, going through school, learning how to actually make maps. Uh, but Robinson was really key 
because he came up with the basically the proper way to ensure that maps were going to be useful and no longer something that say you know wealthy educated folks could just kind of play around with but stuff that everyday people could utilize and this is all because of world war ii and world war ii is this we'll we'll continue to talk about world war ii is this moment where stuff changes and that's because honestly that changed everything right and that's something to think about um little aside here, but with the whole COVID-19 quarantining and isolation and, and all this stuff, social distancing that we're doing, this is a crazy moment. We have the opportunity to change stuff for the better based on this moment, right? But it's, it's simply an opportunity. This could be a thing where, you know, a couple of months, life goes back to normal in terms of, you know, from a health perspective, and we just kind of all kind of crawl out of our homes, and we, we just go about our business. And really what that means is the next time we have some kind of horrible, you know, pandemic that shows up, and we do have these things, this isn't the first one, so we will have another one. Um, but if we don't make any changes, well then, okay, we'll be right back here in, you know, five, ten years, whenever the next one shows up, right? Or, if we as a society decide, okay, we're going to invest resources and time and, and all of that into making things different, yeah, we have that opportunity now to make sure that this isn't as bad next time. And that's exactly what World War II was. It was this way to change life. Um, you know, it was seen as for the better. We'll, we'll question some of that, some of these decisions that were made. But in the case of cartography, this was really, this was good overall for getting information out to people and it's based on the idea like robinson and a lot of these geographers during the war they were kind of they were like the first you know cia uh going back to the what was it oss office of the pre cia intelligence folks geographers in the mid 20th century had some of the best knowledge about where stuff was and what the culture was like and, and that kind of stuff so they were utilized in world war ii robinson was important and coming up with how to make maps for soldiers going into Europe or the, you know, Pacific or wherever, uh, and having just, you know, the lowest ranking soldier be able to look at a map, right? Being able to use that and figure out, okay, I need to go over here um, or interpret, you know, what, what the best route might be or, you know, whatever uh, it might be. So Robinson was key in figuring out how are we going to make maps more democratic i guess in the sense that anybody can use them right uh and so he developed what's known as the map communication model and with this this is crampton uh, uh put this stuff together and it summarizes it quite nicely but there is a, a number one a clear separation between a cartographer and the user Okay, so the person, so cartographer means the person who's making the map. Cartography, that's the art as well as the science of making maps, right? Of representing the earth, representing reality in map form, okay? So the cartographer is the person making the map. The user is the, uh, the person who's reading it, right? Whoever that might be. And that user might be, you know, another cartographer, it might be someone who studied cartography or geography or whatever. Uh, it might be someone who's used to using maps. Or it could be someone, you know, who has never looked at a map ever, right? That, so that's the idea is we need to think about, okay, I'm making the map. The person using it is going to be different from myself, okay? And number two, the map communicates information to the user from the cartographer, right? So... I, as the cartographer, um, I have this information, where stuff is, you know, other values and stuff that we'll see here. I want to convey this. I want to get it to the user. Okay, that's the purpose of the map. It's to share this information. But most importantly is number three here, and that's it's necessary to know the abilities of the map user in comprehending the map, right? So how, you know, classically trained is this map user? 
right? Am I making this map for someone who will understand all of the nuances that go into making maps? Or is it just, you know, it's an average citizen, somebody who simply wants to get this information and go on with his or her business, right? So I got to think about like, what is the user capable of? And therefore what I'm trying to do is make the best possible map for that, you know, map user and the intended use uh, and all of that. Okay. And so using this, this map communication model, uh, we also have the, this idea of map effectiveness. It's another Robinson thing. Okay. We're saying here the task of the map designer, the cartographer, is to enhance the map user's ability to retrieve information. The burden of the map user is to understand the mapping process. So even if, as a map user, um, you know, even if you're not a cartographer by training, or if you haven't taken multiple geography courses or whatever, you still have this responsibility, if you're going to use a map, to, you know, sit down and figure out some basic stuff, to educate yourself at least a little bit in some way to have a sense of how to use a map. Okay, so it's the idea, and this, we're not going to dwell on some of my other classes I get into exactly, you know, what this different stuff is here, but it's the idea. Look, if you're going to use a map, and that goes for, you know, old-timey paper maps, or honestly, if you're going to use your phones for navigation in any way, it's up to you to actually understand how this stuff works, right? And it doesn't mean you have to be some, you know, mechanical engineer uh, or astrophysicist even who like understands where the satellites are uh, and how they're beaming information down, what our phone's doing with this information, how the triangulation is working and all that stuff. You don't have to go that deep, but you at least have to have this basic sense of what's going on with this stuff to be able to effectively use it. Okay, so it's, it goes, you know, on both sides here. Hopefully that makes sense. But with this, um, in terms of using maps as tools of communication, it means that we're going to have certain standards. And so that was something that Robinson was big on. This idea of having, um, you know, set things that are just, they're just always going to be this way. There's a right way to do stuff with a map. Okay, and so one thing that's important, uh, are using symbols consistently, okay? Different, you know, icons, pictures, text, whatever it might be that we have on a map, we want to maintain consistency throughout the map itself. And they don't worry about nominal, ordinal, gradual, it's just different ways of uh, um, using symbols. Like nominal simply means it's, it's, you know, tied to specific names of stuff, whereas Ordinal thing, you know, like order, we have a, you know, ranking, graduated, meaning the size changes. So like on this map uh, of refugee camps uh, around uh, Israel and, and Palestine here, um, you know, we have the, the greater the value uh, in terms of number of refugees, the bigger the circle, right? The bigger the symbol. That's what's going on here. So we want to be consistent. We don't want to change the stuff throughout. We want to maintain that through the map so that you can look at, say, a legend, spend a minute, um, you know, or however long it takes, but hopefully it should be rather quick for you to see what's going on, right? Okay, so the size, this means how many refugees, and we've got the little pie chart thing. Here's the percent that are in actual camps, um, you know, and then you figure out how that works, and then you can look at individual location so we can get a sense of you know what's happening because we're being consistent with the symbols and you as the map user know like your responsibility is to take the time to look at that legend figure out what's going on and then you know read it and interpret take the the information you need from that map okay this and this this is depressing this is refugees and all this this is one using consistent symbology um, that's way more fun. Uh, and this is looking at how close you are to a McDonald's around the United States. And one thing I love about this is that there's no actual, you know, map data for 
the United States or road networks or cities or anything like that. It's simply um, the, these data for how close the nearest McDonald's is um, all over the country. That's the only thing that's mapped, right? But because it's done so consistently, and I don't have the legend here, but I'll explain it. Um, but because it's done consistently, we can easily see what's happening. So like the white that we see, that means there's a McDonald's right next to you, right? Really close to a, a McDonald's there. There's, you know, multiple ones in an area. So you're always close to one. And then it goes to yellow, to orange. It means you're getting further away. The red uh, is getting even further away. And black, and we see here out in the west, um, that's where we're, you're, you're the farthest you can possibly be from a McDonald's. And it was, I assume, it's up here. It was somewhere like in northern Nevada, I want to say, where the guy calculated, the guy who made this, calculated and figured out that's the like there's one point in the United States where you can be further from a McDonald's in this one point than in any other location uh, out there. And the guy actually, and this is commitment to your craft, um, he even like, you know, drove out as far as he could and then he like hopped on a mountain bike uh, and rode out to this area and he brought like a Big Mac and a Coke to eat in that spot. And it's like, you know, it's kind of performance art or whatever, but you got to love it. Um, but so, yeah, look into this, you can get a sense of, you know, like I said, you know, road networks going through Nevada. I'm guessing we're looking at uh, a highway 50 running through here. Right. And that's just, you know, goes back to this, uh, whole idea of, of seeing these networks, getting a sense of where they are based on that consistent symbology. So we can map whatever, but what we want to do is make sure that as the cartographer, we're thinking about the map user, we're trying to make the best map to convey this information. And then as map users, whether we're a cartographer or not, if we're trying to use a map, we need to take the time to sit down and really interpret what's happening. Okay? That's what Robinson was contributing. Another way we can do this uh, are through what we call choropleth maps. Um, you guys might make these, you might not. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, at this point, in a normal semester, you'd make some of these uh, and then, you know, practice this stuff. But what you're doing is you're showing patterns in data using predefined boundaries. So like this poverty status map of the U.S. So this is an old one. This is from uh, 99, the data here. Um, but it's showing based on counting. Okay, so all these different little shapes that we have or different counties around the U.S. But it's got simply four classifications. All right. So the blue or I guess it looks kind of purple uh, on this display or whatever. Um, this purplish blue, however you see it on your screen, uh, the darker one is zero to 7% of people in this county live below the poverty line, right? Meaning that, you know, are actually living in what we would classify technically as, you know, poverty, as being poor, as being impoverished. Okay, so the darker purple blue here, basically what that's saying is these are the, the wealthier counties, right? Where people are doing much better than any other county. And then that lighter shade of purple or blue, again, whatever you see, would be 7% to 12.4%. The pink goes from 12.4% to 22%. The dark red goes from 22% to 56.9%, right? So it's showing where we have, you know, extremes. And you can quickly, you can look at something like this and get a sense of what's happening. You can see along the uh, U.S.-Mexican border right here, we've got a lot of poverty, right? And just you can look at um, uh, areas. I mean, if you know anything about uh, uh, where, you know, indigenous American, you know, native reservations, uh, things like that are. You can see trends with some of that. The South is an area where we have a lot of poverty historically, whereas in New England, people are doing a lot better, right? In the Midwest, people are doing a lot better based on these um, data here. So it's a real great way using a chloropleth map to quickly display information and make it so that, you know, the average map user can look at it, 
spend a minute on the legend, get a sense of what's going on. And we'll see plenty of examples of these throughout the class. Um, you know, this lecture today, but just in just stuff in general, because these are quite useful. Now, just mapping where this stuff is, is kind of cool, just to like tell a story with a map. But what we can also do is we can analyze stuff. We can ask questions about, you know, not only what's happening, but maybe why is it happening, right? Get into uh, the root cause and maybe stop something. Now, this is the kind of the first example everybody points to as uh, using maps to actually solve a, a question or a problem. And this is Dr. Snow's uh, cholera map. <clears throat> and so this was a case back in the 1800s. In London, there's a big cholera outbreak. Cholera is a terrible, terrible disease uh, where you effectively, you poop yourself to death. I mean, it's just, it's grotesque. It's horrendous. It's something that still does happen today. We know the causes today, why it happens. We don't have this happen in a place like the U.S. because we our infrastructure is, is better, but in more impoverished areas, people get it. But back in the time here, when, when snow is, is mapping this stuff, when we have this, this cholera outbreak in 1854 in London, uh, doctors are, you know, they're debating over how cholera is, is uh, passed along, right? How do you get it? Some uh, doctors think it's an airborne disease, right? So it's the idea that it's, it's you know, we sneeze, we're coughing, all that stuff, and the, the little cholera uh, particles come out and we, you know, ingest them in some way and then we get sick with it, right? So something it's airborne. Others, like snow here, argue that it's waterborne that you actually get it from drinking contaminated water. This water that has the cholera uh, in it already, you drink that, or you just, you know, even get it into your mouth in some way or whatever, and then that's how you get the disease. So at the time this is happening, there's this debate. Snow is on that side of waterborne, and he gets the idea to not only, you know, continue to push for this is how it's transmitted, but to actually map out where these deaths are occurring, right? Who's getting cholera? Who's dying from it? And so he's going to, you know, map these things out and see if there's some kind of spatial pattern. And so we're looking at the map right here. So it's like we've got these, you know, dark areas. This is where the, the deaths exist. We've got Broad Street running along here. And he noticed uh, as he's mapping this out that there's really this clustering around Broad Street. Okay? This is where most of the deaths seem to be occurring, and because he sees this as being a, um, you know, a waterborne thing, he's also mapping out these water pumps. All right? This is before indoor plumbing, so if you need some water, you go out to one of these communal pumps you know, and, and it pump up the water from the ground or whatever. And it goes into your, uh, um, you know, your bucket. You take it back to your, your home, right? So he maps this stuff out as well. Turns out it's this Broad Street pump where the, um, the cholera is actually, you know, living. This is where people are getting infected. And then it's something, um, you yeah, know, I read about this a long time ago, but I think it was something like these folks over here who died, even though they had these water pumps closer, you know, to their homes, um, they went to work, like over here, say. So they passed this area, they used this pump for whatever reason, and this is what was getting everybody sick, right? And so the legend goes that, like, Snow went out there, and he didn't post a sign because, you know, figured so many people were illiterate, so he actually just broke the pump handle so no one could use it, and that helped people get better and stop this big epidemic of cholera in London. So that's that's pretty cool, right? Being able to map stuff out and, you know, answer questions to solve problems. That's the kind of stuff we we love to do. And we don't do it quite like this today. We use what's called geographic information systems, or what's known as GIS. And honestly, it's a terrible name. It's a garbage, garbage name. Um, 
but it's what we got. I don't even know who exactly came up with it. There are a few people credited with starting this like back in the 1960s, but it's really, it's just GIS is just, you know, solving problems, answering questions with maps and spatial data. There, that's it. I mean, there are all sorts of these different definitions of it. A database designed to work with map data, a collection of hardware, software, blah, 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 for storing, blah, 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 blah. We're answering questions, right? Spatial questions, meaning these things, you know, are connected to location, to place, to space. This is stuff we've been talking about, um, but we're, we're, you know, doing it with computers just because that makes life easier. You know, the computer can do a lot of stuff that would take us, you know, hours to do. It can do it in seconds, right? So this is all digitized stuff. So it's connected to computer technology, um, but it's really, it's simply asking these spatial questions and answering these spatial questions. That's what we're doing. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not just, you know, nerdy technology. It's really, it's a way of thinking about the world, right? Like I said, asking and answering questions. Now, the way this works, and this is tough, we all have experience with this, you know, these days, we might not realize it. Um, but, you know, a good example uh, are, are the what we call GPS on our phone, stuff like Google Maps. That's actually, that's GIS, all right? It's informed by GPS. It's how we can say, you know, find our location right now, know how close we are to our destination, that kind of stuff. But the actual routing that's going on, when your phone says, okay, drive here and turn here and go here, and it's going to take you about an hour to get there, um, that's GIS. That's using the underlying data layers to ask these questions. And so data layers, what this is saying is that instead of having just a map that's all one thing, right? Like a, you know, a picture of a map. Any of these examples, we go back to Snow's thing here. Um, this map is static, <clears throat> meaning it's a, it's a picture of this stuff. I can't pull stuff out or add stuff to it or whatever. It's just this image, right? And we have like the water pumps and the deaths and the streets and the buildings and all that different stuff. It's all smushed together, okay? With GIS and this layer concept, what we're doing is we're treating every element of the map as a separate and unique thing, okay? So like, you know, roads, we can, we can pull those out and not only have just a separate layer of roads, but we could break it down into different types of roads, right? If we wanted to, that was the smart way to do it. You see examples here, like with the hydrography, looking at, you know, water, water bodies would be like lakes, ocean, stuff like that. Water course would be like a river or a creek or whatever. We can just, you know, add whatever we want, keep it separate. If we decide we don't want something on our map, we get rid of that layer. If we need something else, we add a new layer, right? And so in doing that, what we can also do is easily just ask questions of specific things. If I'm simply interested in, say, navigation, getting from point A to point B, I can ask questions about the roads themselves, and I don't have to worry about county boundaries or whatever, right? So it makes it a more dynamic mapping approach, and then I can add, take away, do whatever, right? The, the limit is my imagination of what I need to add to, again, be able to answer my spatial question. <clears throat> Another key thing here uh, is that with uh, um, these layers, they're all, all the, the, the actual shapes, right? The things we see on the map, they're tied to what we call attribute tables, okay? Meaning this is, gets into this whole database idea, um, but every shape on there has information connected to it. Okay, so like this example right here, these different shapes that we have, one, two, and three, are connected to them are these, these data in here, right? So like vegetation time, for one, this would be a scrub vegetation. Two would be coniferous stuff, you know, pine trees, things like that. Three would be tall grasses, right? And so we could look at that if we're, say, looking for some 
I don't know, some species of, you know, field mouse or, or whatever it might be. If I know that the mouse likes to, you know, live in tall grass or scrub vegetation, but doesn't go into coniferous forests, um, I could, you know, knowing that I could classify certain things. Okay, if I'm looking for this mouse, I want to find, you know, members of the species to catalog it for some environmental report I'm doing or whatever. Um, you know, I could classify this so the map will tell me where to look and where not to look. Right? Don't look. Um, in this coniferous area, look in, uh, you know, one and three here and not two, right? And so this might not seem like a big deal here, but when you're dealing with massive areas and you've got a lot of information and all that, this can save so much time. It can just make life easier. So that's the, the cool thing with this. Now, let's not talk about mice because that's boring. Let's get into murder and crime and all of that. So what I did, and this is, you know, this is all static stuff here. I'm not going to pull up the software, but I just took pictures of this stuff to show you, give you an example of what's going on. So we have the city of Lancaster, <clears throat> this weird gray shape. That's the actual city boundaries. It's a lovely, lovely shape. And then I put the roads here to help, uh, you know, orient this stuff for you so you get a sense of where this is taking place. And we've got uh, in black here, all these black points are the crimes, right? The crimes that took place in the year 2017. And this is something, it's 9,000 something that are here. And I, I know it's 9,000 something because the computer told me when I put this stuff in, right? I didn't count every individual one. And you can see, I mean, they just blur together where this stuff is taking place. So to go in and individually count every single one would be a huge pain. So that was, you know, that was nice right there. But we can see where this stuff is happening. There's 2018, the blue dots. These are, uh, it's like 22,000 crimes. So we had a little jump um, between the years. And what we can do too is we can overlay both of these. Again, these are separate layers. So I can bring stuff in, I can take it out, or whatever. And so I can overlay that, and I know, you know, I told you, it was like 22,000 in uh, 2018, about 9,000 in 2017. Clearly, there's more blue than black, but honestly, we can't see much in here. There's not a lot of obvious stuff going on here when we look at it. We can't really say that, you know, exactly where there was a crime in 2017, but not in 2018 or whatever. It's just not useful, okay? But what I did was I first went into the computer uh, and simply said, hey, what's going on spatially here? Is there a pattern with these different crimes, both the 2017 and the 2018 values? And for both of them, um, yes, these were clearly clustered. Okay, There's clearly a pattern, and not just there's a pattern, but it's clustered around something, right? Uh, and so you can see, and this is all statistics stuff. If I, I don't know if you guys have taken statistics yet or not. Uh, I would say if you're, you know, not going into engineering or something where there's a very specific type of math that's required, like calculus or whatever, um, and you need that that college math requirement, take statistics because this is so useful for everyone who's not, like I said, you know, an engineer or Somebody who, who, again, needs to use very specific type of math to solve specific problems. But statistics we use all the time, but very few of us actually know what they mean. And what's great, too, you take the class, you learn the basics of it, but then when you really start working with it, like this stuff here, the computer's doing all the, the work, right? You just need to be able to know, like, what's a good test to run, what isn't a good test. You need to, again, be able to criticize, you know, what you're getting critically uh, uh, question it so you don't drive to Croatia, right? But I didn't do any math here. Uh, I made the, you know, the computer did all this work. And so what it told me is that, yeah, these crimes are clustered. And you can see down here, there's less than a 1% likelihood that this clustered pattern could be the result of random chance. Okay, so based on this, because this stuff isn't random, it means there's a spatial pattern there. Right? It means that, the, and therefore we can question 
what is it that's causing this stuff to take place, right? Get a sense of, of why the crimes are happening. If these things are just random, you know, there's, it's not tied to space, right? Or place or, or whatever. But because it's clustered here, we can start to explore more. And so what I did, these, you know, these black dots are too much going on here. So I ran this. This is effectively saying this is the clustering that's taking place within a, a you know, a standard deviation. Where are all of these crimes clustering about? So it, it's that red circle. Uh, and you can also do it with some kind of directional uh, uh, attribute to it. So not only are they clustered here, but they're more or less running along, like you could see, Avenue J and Avenue K. So they have kind of this east to west, you know, pattern to them. So that's for, again, 2017. Here's 2018. Same kind of deal, but with the yellow um, circle this time. There's the directional thing. Kind of the same shape. But now we can compare these two things, right? And really get a sense of what's happening. And so if you look at it, um, we've got, you know, our 2017 stuff is clustered here. The yellow 2018, clearly there are more crimes, so it's growing, but not just growing. In fact, let's go here. It's not just growing, it's moving west. West. Oh, good Lord. You got, I mean, I don't know where you guys are listening to this right now, um, but I assume we've talked about this. We're all you know, wealthy, we're not poor folks uh, at all. I mean, I'm on the west side of the Antelope Valley because, you know, um, you know, the east side is, is scary. That, that's a terrifying place. So I, I bought a house on the west side so I would be safe and secure. And then you look at this and, oh my God, it's happening. In fact, if we look at it, 30th Street West, right here, Avenue K, right here. So back in 2017, you know, it was, ABC was okay. In uh, 2018, overtaken by crime. I don't even, you know, have the latest stuff uh, right now. No telling what it looks like now. This is why it's actually good that we're all in quarantine, that we're not at school, because, my God, how dangerous, um, you know, would that place be right now? Terrifying! Are you guys terrified at all? Should you? Be? I mean, that's, I mean, look at that. Crime is coming your way. If you're not terrified, it's probably because you're a criminal. Right? It's because you're you're somebody who's making this this ring grow right here. Right? But also it kind of tells you like, you know, you want to be safe, move over to the east side, right? And the west side, this is this is terrifying. You don't want to live over here. Um what do you guys think? Does this uh does this freak you out? <laughs> I'll wait while you respond. Yeah? Okay, good. Well here's here's what you should be doing. I present this stuff here. But again, we're learning about, you know, being critical with our cartography. What should you question, right? Should you take this as gospel, as, as oh no, this is, this is terrifying, or should you question what's being depicted? Now, one way to do it is you can think about, you know, why is this thing produced in the first place? Now, in a, a realistic um example here you could say you know i'm in charge of of mapping out uh, you know where crimes are taking place but also you know i'm doing so for the sheriff's department to, to get a sense of where we need to send resources or, or whatever right if we need to build a new sheriff substation here in the antelope valley where should we put it right clearly based on this we shouldn't build it out here uh like at 80th street east um if anything it should be like right here in the heart of it. It should be at, at ABC, effectively. Um, that's where it should be, right? So that's, if I'm doing this for like a real reason, that might be why I make it. I honestly, I just, you know, crime stuff makes people pay attention. It's kind of a sexy topic. It's better than, you know, field mice sightings or whatever it might be. Uh, plus, it's just, it's great to freak people out. Um... You know, usually because I'm giving this, uh, um, you know, in this exact location, right? So we realize how vulnerable we are. But if I'm trying to freak you out, what are some of the questions you should be asking? All right, number one, you should ask, what do you mean crimes? All right, because I just have down here, Lancaster crimes. Um, 
I'm not being specific, right? And there's a reason why I'm not doing that. It's because I mapped everything, right? Everything the sheriff's department gave me, I put it on there. So there's murder and assault and, and you know, violent, awful stuff. But there's also jaywalking or whatever the, you know, the, the minor offenses are. I don't have a full list of this stuff, but I just threw it all out there. So you have no idea if what this means uh, is that violent crimes are, are occurring in the West and kind of heading further and further West into where the, you know, the rich people live, um, you know, out this way. <coughs> you don't know if it's the violent stuff. You don't know if it's, you know, parking violations or whatever. It's simply all crimes because that's scarier. When I actually pulled out, um, like homicide, as one example, where the murders during this time took place, completely random. There's no spatial pattern whatsoever, meaning that we can't really do much with that in terms of finding some spatial cause, like where stuff, you know, is going to be taking place, right? So homicides in the Antelope Valley during this period were clearly a randomly occurring thing. It had more to do with the people involved um, than you know, the location itself, right? So that's how that works. So yeah, I just threw it all in there because it's scary. But honestly, if I try to map the stuff that we're actually scared about, we don't see the same pattern at all. Totally different map gets produced. Okay? Another thing to question is that this is simply Lancaster, right? But if you're familiar with the area, you know right underneath here is the city of Palmdale, where we have an equal number of people living. Um, clearly, there are crimes taking place down in Palmdale, but I don't have any of the data here. So when I run the analysis, like when we go back to this kind of stuff, it's not taking any of this information from Palmdale into consideration. For all we know, you know, this is 22,000 crimes right here. There could be, you know, 10,000 crimes down in Palmdale. There could be 100,000. We don't know what that is. And if that is the case, um, then, you know, the clustering might actually be down here somewhere where this is actually way safer to live up in Lancaster than down in Palmdale. I doubt that, you know, being a Palmdale resident, it's a God's country down here. If you live up here in Lancaster, you should move south. This is really this is the place to be. It's the same place. Um, you know, we all, we know that, but that's why we need to have the, the other data in here. So your boundaries that you select, there's a reason for that. Okay. And then finally, another thing to question is like with this clustering that is occurring, I mean, yeah, of course it's clustering around here. That's where more people live or work or shop or whatever, right? We don't have many crimes up this way uh, because we don't have many people living up this way, right? Like you can't break into a house if there isn't a house for you to break into, right? Or you can't stab somebody or whatever. So there are crimes clearly that take place all over. The clustering though, most likely it's the result of this is just where people are, right? So these are all questions we should be asking. And so if you're making these maps, it's up to you to take this into consideration, right? So if I'm not actually just trying to scare you guys and to prove a point or whatever, I'm trying to make this map I'm going to agonize over, you know, how much data can I get? Where is it taking place? What other layers can I add to to account for, you know, some of the, the patterns that are, are showing up and stuff like that? You want to take the time to make sure that the map you're making is that best possible map. And if you're the map user, meaning you see this, say, it, you know, it shows up online um, or somebody's presenting it at a meeting or whatever, you look at this, you want to instantly... Well, first, you want to, okay, get a sense, look for a legend, or listen to the person explaining it, or whatever. Um, you know, get a sense of what's being depicted. But then, immediately start questioning. Okay, well, what would have happened if they did this? Or what are they, you know, define crimes. What, what is it? Is it a specific type? Is it every single type of crime that could take place? You know, these are the questions we need to be asking. And honestly guys want to be really awesome with this stuff uh in the fall sign up for geography 205 the introduction to gis class this is the kind of stuff you get to learn is how to actually make these maps and you learn a valuable skill 
And that not only can you, you know, make them, but you can also interpret them, but you have a skill that employers will want to hire you for. All right? We're going to talk about this. So like Roger and me in the past, we'll talk more about it when I get into industry and globalization and that kind of stuff. But as you are going through college here, especially in light of the craziness we're living in right now, start thinking about the skills you're going to have when you leave college. All right? What are you going to be able to offer to employers? How can you get that job that is the kind of job where you hopefully won't be laid off in the next pandemic or other you know, major disaster that takes place, right? GIS offers a great way to, to do this. To, you have this very valuable skill um, you know, that you can be paid to do. And typically, you know, there's so few GIS people working for a government agency or a company or whatever that they become more important. Right? It's harder to lay off the GIS people because they do this very specialized key job, whereas other folks might be easier to let go. Right? And so this just it goes back to that whole mercenary talk I gave you guys that in, in today's economy, in kind of late capitalist, globalized uh, um, stuff that you're going to be entering when you leave college, you want to think in this way, right? You want to help everybody you can. Uh, you know, we do live in a society. We'll we'll talk about all that stuff uh, as well. But but for your own, you know, just stability, think about what you're going to have, what skills you're going to have that are going to keep you safe when you're on your own, when you're out there working. And GIS, it's a great opportunity. Geography 205, it's actually offered online, even, you know, before all this pandemic stuff. And, and I show you guys how to map this stuff. It's fantastic. But, hey, you know, I don't need you. Go ahead. Don't take the class. Um, yeah, I'll help you get a job, but I'm sure I'm sure you'll be fine. Geography 205. Okay. All right. All right. So yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, let's get into. I've been rambling uh, too much anyway. Let, let's just skip. So the mental map thing. I mean, I'm gonna skip through this because we didn't get to do it. I was gonna you know, teach you guys firsthand about uh, um, mental maps, the biases that we have in our brains. Um, it's the idea, there's this New Yorker cover. That's the classic example of a mental map. Everybody uses this to show that, you know, if you're this New Yorker, your mental map is such that here, you know, around Ninth Avenue, uh, you, you know where stuff is. You know the individual you know, buildings themselves, as well as the windows and the just the details, right? You head out, it gets a little fuzzier as you go away from your key location and you get to the Hudson and then over there is Jersey on the other side. You know, you know that much, right? And then you kind of go out, you know, there's some mountains and shit, you know, like Utah and Vegas and, you know, Los Angeles. You kind of have a general idea of where stuff is. There's an ocean yeah, these countries over there, and it just gets fuzzier and fuzzier as you go. That's a classic mental map. This is when I had I would have you guys draw. The idea is I, I have students draw, um, uh, you know, directions, map, whatever it might be. Just tell me how to get from Lancaster um, to L.A. Uh, as well as to San Francisco. This is from a you know past class. They all look like this. Um, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, clearly we start out ABC, we got some detail going to LA students have a much better chance of getting me there. There's things, you know, really nice houses, um, <coughs> which <laughs> well, I don't know exactly where these ones are. Um, uh, exactly. This is Palmdale or what, or getting that into Acton. Um, but at least, you know, it's again, it's the idea that we have these houses. We have an in and out. You're passing by here. You see some mountains, you get down to L.A., going to San Francisco, it's just vague. I don't know, Bakersfield, San Francisco, doesn't even tell me what freeway to take or if there are multiple ones or whatever. It's simply just, it gets fuzzier, right? It's another example. So we got Lancaster, going down to Palmdale, and, and you can see specific roads and all these details going up to San Francisco. Again, I don't know, you get Cal City, Bakersfield, that's one you guys all seem to know. We've got San Francisco. We even have Sacramento right above it. No, you know. Oh, and I this person clearly saw Sacramento. I mean, you can see. 
The point being, not to pick on these individual students, because like I said, they're all terrible um, in their own special little way. But it's great. I mean, this is this just goes to show that we have a much better concept of what's happening right around us than further away. Especially in places, if you've never been to San Francisco or have no, you know, family up north or no connection to it or whatever, it, you know, it might as well be China or Russia or, or something like that, right? A foreign location. So I bring that up just to remember that when people are making maps, they already are, they're bringing their own biases with them. Okay. And so that's something we want to question. Also, if we're making maps, we want to question this stuff or even just trying to get a sense of what's happening. You read some news story or see something on TV, you're, you know, trying to picture what's happening, like the coronavirus, you know, Wuhan, China. That's if I said, you know, draw a map, how to get to Wuhan from here. Oh, in fact, yeah, that would be fun. Um, to do, we, we couldn't do it. I would screw it up. Um, I don't know exactly where Wuhan is in relation to everything else. Um, you know, in China or East Asia in general, that's the thing that we, we have these mental maps of the world and they're, they're lacking quite often. Um, you know, the further we get from our comfort zone, uh, propaganda now is not just using these biases or it's not, it's not a lack of information necessarily, but it's where we take information and we massage it. We manipulate uh, a little bit to try to, you know, convey a specific message. We're never lying. Okay. And that's the key thing with propaganda is that a prop propaganda map or whatever it might be. It's never a lie. Okay. It's like those, those crime maps that I just showed you. Um, those you could, you know, I was doing this with the idea of propaganda and then I'm trying to convince you that we're all going to die, you know, sitting in a classroom and, uh, at Antelope Valley college. Um, but I never lied. I never, you know, added information that, you know, wasn't there or switched stuff around or whatever. I simply, you know, kept all the crimes in. I was, you know, purposely vague on some stuff and specific on other things and, and stuff like that. Right. So good propaganda means you're not lying. You're just, you know, convincing someone that your answer or whatever, your scenario, that's the best one. Okay? And so that's, you know, and maps are a great way to do this. We see these in times of war. On the left, this was um, something the Germans dropped. You hear about, you know, pamphlets and stuff being dropped into... Uh, uh, war zones by one side, you're trying to demoralize the other side. You're trying to get them to give up, right? To either just surrender or, you know, to have soldiers run away or whatever. So you can see the Germans on the left here are trying to show the allied forces. Um, you know, British soldiers, look at this map. It gives you a true situation. You're surrounded. You know, you don't have a chance, right? There are a lot of thick, dark arrows showing how surrounded everybody was, just saying, give up. And then as the war changes, too, we have this one was dropped by the Allied soldiers into Germany. And this time, you know, same kind of idea. Look at your situation. You're surrounded. Give up. Um, but again, you know, dark arrows, very clear messages being given right here, right? Trying to, and whether it's, you know, true or not, is irrelevant. Uh, and you could say, you know, at the end of the war, the Germans were losing and stuff like that, but still you're, you're trying to quickly convey this message and you're trying to discourage critical questioning of this stuff, right? You're trying to make it look like, yeah, I mean, it's an open and shut case. Don't question at all. Just go with it, right? That's the idea. So, and it can come in a variety of ways, you know, this is trying to get Australian men to enlist, um, you know, into the, the Australian army to make sure that the Germans don't take over Australia. Um, and, and they, you know, take, you know, Australia's crossed out New Germany, uh, written over there. Sydney is crossed out. Nietzscheburg, uh, is written there and Zeppelinsburg and, and stuff like that. Trying to use, again, use maps, use very clear stuff to convey something. If you don't join the army, this will happen. Don't, don't question it at all. Don't, don't critically assess this. Look at this, have an emotional reaction and then behave accordingly, right? Which is how I want you to behave. 
which is to enlist in the army. And this was something actually the Germans were behind before the war actually broke out. And so if you're, you know, all of you students of history, um, you recall, I mean, it wasn't a case of like Germany just one day said, we're going to war with the world. And, and that was it. They invade Poland. And people kind of go like, that's not cool. We need to do something. But then other people are like, well, you know, let's just tell them to not invade anybody else and maybe we'll be okay. You know, there was a lot of debate around this stuff. But Germany's saying like, look, what are you talking about? Calling us an aggressor nation that we're, we're, you know, too much trouble or whatever. We took Poland, right? We have this little small territory still. You look at Great Britain, look at the British Empire, who, you know, at their peak here owned a quarter of the world they went around and took over all sorts of people now they weren't europeans they were brown people and black people all over the world so that was seen as okay but the germans were like what are you talking about this is hypocritical all right and this is before to you know knowledge of concentration camps and stuff like this so so this was something where the average person could look at this and say you know what actually yeah, that's 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 way worse than what the Germans are. Eh, let them be, right? Let them go. What could possibly go wrong, right? Clearly, there's a lot of, of critical thought that could go into this. And, you know, we discuss it for hours. But that's not what it's designed for. It's there to get you simply going along with what the, the person is trying to get you to go along with. Hey, here's a Cold War one. You get a lot of, like, octopus tentacles and cool stuff like that. Um, here's another one. They, look, these are all depressing too, because this is like dead women and children and all. That. Let's let's move on. Let's get here. We are. This is this is the good stuff, right? This is what we're gonna wrap up this lecture with. Is we're gonna talk about um, political maps, presidential mapping, stuff like this. This is very important to understand. Uh, have a sense of of uh, um, you know what we're really seeing. And so this map, this was during the impeachment hearings, the, you know, the, the trial and all this stuff. And, and our, our dear leader, uh, Donald Trump sends this out, uh, on Twitter, you know, the, the map, the election results, and then the words try to impeach this. I mean, that, oh, so badass, right? How hardcore that is. Try to impeach this. Yeah. Clearly, there's some, you know, there's a there's a message, right? There's that persuasion out there. This isn't some, some, uh, um, you know, impersonal, you know, just scientific information or whatever. There's he's doing this for a reason, right? He's trying to show, showing this um, that look, most of the country voted for him, loves him. You know, why are you trying to overturn the results of the election? That was something that was said, but this map gives kind of that like common sense like man he clearly won by a landslide that's uh yeah why 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 are we impeaching him if everybody likes him or whatever like why are the democrats picking on the president all the time or whatever it might be now that's completely wrong okay in the sense of of you know winning by a landslide and a lot of people were finally quick to point this out it seems like as a society we're getting better um, about this uh, information here. Um, but one thing that, that people said was simply, landmass does not equal population, right? Meaning just because there's a lot of red out here, doesn't mean there's anybody who actually lives out here, right? We have more people living on the coasts and the cities and stuff like that. This map, it's not lying, but it's clearly propaganda in the sense that it's, it's not giving the best representation of reality in an effort to get you to go along with the, the map maker's, uh, you know, point of view or whatever. And honestly, we can go even before this, like we've done this for a while now. We go before that, we see right here, Bush Country 2004. But I didn't even say that right. Because you can look at it. I mean, that you don't just say like Bush Country 2004. No, it's like Bush Country 2004. And you shoot your guns in the air. It's just like the impeach this thing. I just, you can hear um, the, the, you know, the attitude behind the uh, phrase there. But this came after the 2004 election. Like, this was the best example of this kind of stuff before 
we have this. And you can see the maps are more or less the same. Honestly, there, there's some differences in here, but it's, um, you know, you still see this idea of a lot of blue on the outside, little islands here and there, but for the most part, it's red. And so this was trying to show, as if you recall or have read about it or whatever, the 2000 presidential election was a mess. Florida screwed the whole thing up. Um, but it was a thing where it was like this 50-50 um, uh, um, result, and it wound up being the Supreme Court. Basically, like, had to flip the coin. I mean, it was just a disaster. So a lot of people questioned if George W. Bush, um, you know, had a legitimate, you know, election uh, victory, right? Whereas after 2004, there was a lot of effort to try to show that, no, he clearly won and he deserved to be president. And there's no question. I mean, he, he did beat John Kerry. That's clear. Um, but, you know, stuff like this came out to really show that, no, he's legit. Right? That's the idea. Now, with all of this stuff, um, typically what we see uh, is something that looks more like this. Right? So this first one, <coughs> we're using counties. Again, that's what all these different shapes are. So, like, right here... Here's L.A. County. That's our shape. That's Kern County, San Bernardino. Um, Orange County is right underneath Ventura. That's what we're looking at um, right here. But these are all the counties around the, the country and how they went. So red for the Republican. So red going for George W. Bush. In this case, blue going for the Democrat, John Kerry. We've, we've stuck with this whole red-blue thing. It wasn't always like this. We've switched before. Um, so if you look at older maps, it can be confusing, um, but this is what we've dealt with in the 21st century. So red means uh, uh, Republican, blue means Democrat, right? That's the idea there. Based on the state, though, because we can, you know, break it down by county, but when we're dealing with the Electoral College, we're looking at the majority in the state itself, and then the whole state goes for whomever, right? So like with California here, went for the Democrat, for John Kerry in this specific election. If you look back here, you can see you've got red, you've got blue. So it wasn't that every single person voted for John Kerry in the state, but it's just he got the majority of the votes. So California goes for Kerry. Whereas in Nevada, more people went for W. Bush and, you know, he gets the votes. There you go. So this is what we see right here and now we're getting a little more blue a little less red um but it, you know that can be complicated uh, as well right and so it goes back to this whole electoral college thing here and these change every single election because it's based on population but it's the idea like this is a map from the 2012 election so california based on our population it's really based you know off of census data and all that stuff don't forget to fill out your census forms if you haven't um, but we had 55 electoral college votes to give in 2012 i don't know what it was back here in 2004 it was a little less than that we could say you know i don't know, 50 votes or whatever right so it's the idea you're trying to get to 270 electoral college votes to win right so california is great because it's got a lot of people and therefore you get a lot of uh, these votes other places like Wyoming, you know, not as many people live in Wyoming, so they have three electoral college votes, right? So you can look around and you get a sense of where we have a lot of people, right? California is the most populous state. Texas is coming in at uh, number two here. You can see New York, you know, 29 votes. So you can see how this, this breaks out, where people actually are, right? Here's another way to look at it. Um, the, this map is showing with the, the white dots, one dot represents 7,500 people. Okay, So wherever you have just an individual dot, means in this general location, wherever we are in this you know specific city or, or whatever, we have 7,500 people live there in this area. And you can see bigger cities, like we go down to New York City. It's just this mass of white here and in the general tri-state area and up and down um, the Atlantic seaboard and all that. You got a lot of people over here. L.A., 
down to Orange County and out to Santa Barbara and all that. Same deal. A lot of people here, right? Where it's black means you don't. You don't have, you know, even 7,500 people in an area to be able to map. Way more people living on the coast than, say, out here in the western United States, right? Um, so another thing. Again, why we go back to that whole Bush country 2004 where they impeach this. That whole, you know, landmass doesn't equate actual people. That's what we're seeing here, right? Not a lot of people live here in this part of the country. Now this, this is the way to do it, right here. These cartograms are fantastic. And I showed you one last time with, you know, GDP and population, and we saw the world. In that case, this cartogram, all this have done by Mark Newman, fantastic. Uh, started doing, I think it was maybe 2004 is when he started, um, but does it with current stuff, as we'll see. But it's a great way to really put this stuff into perspective, right? So it's based on our electoral college votes here, um, but the sizes are exaggerated, right? So California, because it has the most, it swells up, right? It looks big and ridiculous. We go back to Wyoming, which has the three, it shrinks down, right? So now if we compare the blue to the red, you see it's not this obvious either or, kind of thing, right? Clearly, there's, there's you know, something else at work here. There's the, the red and the blue are, are much closer, right, than like that, that Bush country stuff or impeaches stuff or whatever. Again, this is the 2004 one that we're looking at. So back here, a lot of red, hardly any blue. We can get rid of the whole slogan at the top, clean it up a little bit. But yeah, that's what it looks like. That clearly is more red than blue. Okay, but here's another way to think about this stuff. This was done with GIS <coughs> by the company ESRI, which makes a lot of this stuff. Again, with what really happened and why we see this, like why I'm doing this with the 2004 election, is this is when mapping software kind of reached this new level and more people were working with it and stuff like that. And we see just better ways to represent the results of stuff, right? And so what they're showing here which is interesting, although it's still kind of hard to compare, um, but they're showing the height here, this 3D value. It's based on the population, right? So around Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, these big cities, Miami, you can see down here, we have these populous cities. They go for the Democrat. Other places, like let's just keep picking on Wyoming right here, none of the counties really pop up that much because there aren't that many people in the state of Wyoming, right? So you can see, and so even in a place like California, if we come back here, where it may look like in California itself, there's more red that we see. If you're looking at where the people are, there are way more people living in the areas where it went blue, right? So these other counties that, that went red, even though it, you know, two-dimensionally is showing that there's a lot more red than blue, we look at that third dimension, we see there's more blue. That's why California went, in this case, for John Kerry. Okay, but this is where we get even better, I think. Because this whole, our whole emphasis on red versus blue, like everybody talks about how tribal we are, and it's my side versus your side, and all that. And we want to be like, how did we get here? And, you know, the media like to forget that they, they made a real point of, of hyping this whole idea of red America, blue America. You know, they could have helped prime uh, all this stuff for being tribal. But when you look at this map, what we're seeing here uh, are these different shades of purple. So it's taking into account not just, you know, who won, but how close that, that result was. Again, based on the, the county itself. So we can go back down here to L.A. County just because that's where we are, that's what we know, um, you can see it's purple. It's not bright blue, right? There's there's purple uh, in here. Now it's more blue than red with this shade of purple, meaning that, you know, there was a, a Democrat, uh, you know, who was victorious here, but there were people who voted Republican in L.A. County. Being up here in the Antelope Valley, in northern L.A. County, we're a more conservative 
part of LA County. So some of the, the red tones in here, you know, most likely were from votes up here back in 2004, right? You can see Kern County, a little more red. So clearly they went more for, um, uh, you know, for Bush at the time. You get other areas that are purple. So you can get this sense of, you know, how close was that victory? Some clearly, you know, very red areas, but there are also clearly some very blue areas. But for the most part, we got a lot of purple, meaning that we're, it's close, right? There's not one clear victorious thing that maybe, you know, we should kind of talk to each other because we're, we're disagreeing, um, you know, so closely on, on this stuff, right? And then here, we take it all the way and we get the shades of purple and we do the cardigram. And this, this shows what happened back in 2004, right? This is the election, right? The, this is what happened here. You can see it's a lot of purple. Again, we have some, some deeper red, we have some deeper blue, but it's a lot of purple, right? So if we compare these two, neither one of these is lying at all, but I would argue that the one on the right is the correct one right, or the more accurate one, the better representation of what took place, right? The 2004 election was not a landslide, you know, for George W. Bush in the sense that, you know, most Americans thought he was the, the perfect choice or whatever. Clearly, it, you know, it shows a divided body of voters that, that, you know, in America in 2004, keep in mind, this is right after 9-11, People are scared. People aren't sure what's the best way to move forward, how to stay safe in this country. We were a mess. We were an emotional mess. And it, it explains a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with today. So I think it's a way better way to look at something like this 2004 election. And then we can, of course, look at more recent stuff. Like here's 2012. So this was Romney, uh, Obama. Um, you know, and, and this wasn't as easy to do because Obama won, you know, you see New Mexico and Colorado here. So putting the blue in the middle kind of, you know, changes some of that stuff. But still, when we do the cartogram and the purple, you can see there's more red and there's more blue. You really see, you know, less purple and, and more clear sides here again. And it is a case of, you know. Why are we so tribal? Because, you know, through the early part of the century, we've been hyping this whole sense of, you know, red and blue American. And you can see it really kind of took hold with these later elections. All right. Um, here's 2016. That was a good one. Um, so it's, it's a, again, red, Trump, blue, Clinton. Um, this one gets kind of funky compared to other stuff. Um, cause if we go back, like you can see Florida going for Obama here, we have more of the, the Midwest, you know, notoriously Michigan and Wisconsin, these places not going for Hillary Clinton. That's what a lot of people saw as her downfall. People expected Florida to just, you know, go Republican in this case, but looking at this, um, you know, we hear about how, you know, Hillary won the popular vote, uh, Trump won the uh, electoral college. When you look at it, you don't see much difference uh, in here in terms of how the map plays out as we do that cartogram. But you can definitely see when we get to the 2016 one, that red, that blue, it's even more vibrant. There's even less purple. Now, the purple still exists. There are clearly places where it's not either or, but you can see, especially with these big cities, you know, there's a lot of blue in there and then in what we call, you know, the heartland um, throughout the the Midwest and the kind of the center of the uh, country, you see a lot of that red. There's this clear urban rural divide at work. That's much clearer in seeing something like this than like that, you know, trying to beach this or whatever uh, uh, map that we saw, right? So it's, again, it's the best way to display these data. And there, and you can see too, look at that, more red, more blue. So going from, you know, the last election to the one before that, just getting more and more tribal. 
And there, yeah, there's the two different ways to see it. This would be the more accurate representation of reality. And, you know, I'm done. Um, skip this stuff to hell with it. Uh, this is just getting into, like, oh, there's cool stuff we can do, and we can give mapping capabilities to average people and all that. Look, we don't necessarily want that. Like, it's good to share this stuff, but just keep in mind, we got this, right? Very easy to drive to Croatia. And we got you guys who, um, you know, bless your hearts. Um, you know, just be careful is all I'm saying. In fact, you know what? Geography 205. Sign up for that in the fall. All right? All right. Okay, that's it for uh, today. I uh, hope you learned something. Um, yeah, we'll just keep on uh, doing this stuff. I'll talk to you. When are we? Uh, oh, it's racism. Next time we're going to talk about racism. We'll solve that. Um, yeah, we'll fix it, and, uh, and that'll be good. All right. I'll talk to you people later. Uh, stay healthy.